1989. I'm 16. I'm back in school. I hold in my hands the envelope with my GCSE results in. I haven't done a great deal of work, but there's one thing I'm counting on that's going to get me through this. My genius. So let's see, shall we? OK, English language is C. Sociology, C. Drama, C. You can cope with that. Maths, D. Biology, D. History, E. English literature, N. A. I don't even know what that means. Maybe, maybe that's a new way of saying an A. <laughs> Turns out it just means non-applicable. Those teachers didn't even enter me for the exam for various reasons. So what went wrong? Well, I'm not going to blame the school. I'm not going to blame my teachers. I'm not even going to blame myself. But I disengaged from education. I didn't like to be told what to do. I didn't like to think like everyone else. And I didn't like to do what everyone else was doing. In short, I was a bit of a rebel without a cause. Now, 25 years later, I head an educational charity. I've, um, I work in schools. I've written books on education. And I have two degrees. So what went right? Or as my 16-year-old self would say, what went wrong? Um, well, in a word, philosophy. And I'd like to say something about, um, about how philosophy helped me, among other things, how it helped me to re-engage with education. I'd also like to say something about how philosophy, what philosophy has to say about collaboration and about why I think it's necessary. And I think all these things are connected. OK. Let's start with collaboration. My 16-year-old self might say something like this. Isn't collaboration just another word for conformity? And aren't we brainwashed in this kind of message all the time that we should work together towards a better, happier future? And isn't this just naive? And the children, aren't they brainwashed with this sort of stuff on CBeebies? Well, let's take my 16-year-old self's idea seriously for a minute. What about healthy competition? What about thinking outside the box? What about those that go against the flow? What about those that stand out from the crowd, like Beethoven, Nietzsche, Einstein? What about those that challenge authority, such as Martin Luther King, Galileo, Mary Wollstonecraft? What about those famous historical spats between people like Newton and Leibniz? Where does all this fit into the idea of collaboration? And do all these rhetorical questions that I'm now asking you mean that we shouldn't, in fact, be collaborative? We should be competitive, combative? Well, no. I don't think it does mean that, as long as we understand collaboration in the right kind of way. I'd like to return to my story, if I may. Um, as you can imagine, with GCSEs like that, I left school, went on to become a musician. Um, but one of the things that, me, that, that the school did give me was a love of reading and a love of learning. So I continued to read and to self-educate. And my reading list might well read like a typical older teenager boy's uh, literature list. So I read George Orwell, Aldous Huxley, Dostoevsky. Ah, sorry, yes. My slides uh, are a little bit more honest than I am. OK, so I read, I read Tolkien, I read Stephen King, and I read Philip K. Dick. I still do, as a matter of fact. Um, but I also read Orwell and Huxley. Dostoevsky, and among others, D.H. Lawrence. And it was through reading literature like this, all of it in fact, that I became acquainted with philosophy. And yes, I did read the D.H. Lawrence for the philosophy. Honest. 
So, what I did with my newfound discovery was that I, I used it to build up ammunition against those I saw as opponents, which in those days were very much people of faith. But I would later discover, well, this is a misuse of philosophy, as I would later discover. You see, later on, I would find out about Socrates and the sophists. And to tell this story, I'm going to have to go back to ancient Athens. The cradle of democracy, as I'm sure you all know. And citizens, in order to get their hands on power, they had to learn how to be persuasive. So, a group of philosophers known as the Sophists offered their services to citizens in order to teach them to be persuasive, in order to teach them to be able to win arguments. But there was a, a philosopher called Socrates around at the same time who thought that this wasn't the way in which philosophy should be done. Not to win arguments. It should be used collaboratively to seek the truth. Socrates called his preferred way of doing philosophy dialectic, which literally means through speech. And as a matter of fact, Socrates didn't write anything down. He did all his philosophy in the form of conversations with people in the marketplace. Now, I think it's fair to say that most philosophers these days side with Socrates in this debate. I, however, was using so uh, philosophy like the sophists did. But it might seem from all this that philosophy is collaborative. But Montaigne, as he would say in the 16th century, he would say that the enemy of a good conversation is perfect harmony. But never fear. You see, because the very notion of philosophical collaboration demands and includes opposition. But if, for me to say a bit more about this, I'd like to introduce you to another um, philosopher, a German philosopher called Hegel. And in order to help you with his idea about how dialectic works, I would like to introduce some imagery. So let's take a colour, such as blue. I want you all now to think of the opposite of blue. Now I know it's difficult to imagine colours having opposites and perhaps they can't really have opposites. So instead, try and think of a contrasting colour to blue maybe even the, the most contrasting you can. I'm guessing that most of you are thinking of red. Now what happens if you put blue and red together? You get purple. So this will hopefully help us get our head around Hegel's idea. Because Hegel thought that ideas themselves follow a pattern like this. Ideas begin with a thesis, a main idea, if you like. This is followed by a contrasting idea, an antithesis. And then these are blended to give you synthesis. So to help you with this, let's um, take something concrete uh, that we can all get our heads around, something like cheese and pickle sandwich. So, I would like, first of all, imagine someone comes along and says the best sandwich, the perfect sandwich, is a cheese sandwich. So I want you all to imagine eating a cheese sandwich. What is it going to taste like? It's going to be cheesy, bready, maybe quite dry and sticky after a while. It's going to make your mouth go a bit like oh, that, maybe. Someone comes along and says, no, 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 the perfect sandwich is a pickle sandwich. So you now imagine eating a pickle sandwich. It's going to be tart, sharp, vinegary, maybe sugary, very different from a cheese sandwich. Make your mouth go a bit like that, maybe. Then someone comes along and says, no, 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 no. you're both wrong and you're both right. It's the perfect sandwich is a cheese and pickle sandwich. Now, you don't need to imagine eating a cheese and pickle sandwich. Everyone's done it. And you don't even have to like cheese and pickle sandwiches to know that there's a certain balance. The vinegar offsets the fat and vice versa. 
So this concrete idea helps you to get your head around how this works. But let's, let's look at the more abstract ideas that Hegel had in mind. So if we take as our thesis something like capitalism, then what would be the contrasting idea? Maybe something like Marxism, opposing idea. Then these are blended to give you perhaps a mixed economy, something, that, something like what we live in now, that has both welfare state but also uh, free market. But I don't want you to see how this necessarily works just with great big abstract ideologies. It also, you'll also find it present in conversations, everyday conversations, especially those which are of a philosophical nature. So for instance, you can imagine someone saying, it's not fair. Why is it not fair? Because I didn't get what I want. So the thesis would, would be that fairness is getting what you want. The next person says, that's not what fair is. Fair is when other people get what they want. So now we have the contrasting idea, the antithesis. And then the third person comes in and says, you know, you're, you're both wrong, you're both right, because surely for something to be fair, you have to take into consideration what you want, but also what others want. You can see, again, how this kind of pattern is happening in a conversation. And there's one last idea I'd like to try and get across from Hegel's dialectic. Um, and for this, I'm going to return to the more familiar territory, at least for me, of philosophy. So, the first a philosopher 3,000 years ago called Thales, he had a big idea. And his idea was that everything was made of one substance, a basic substance. Now, it's not a, an unreasonable idea. He proposed that it was water. It goes with my blue on the slide. And he said um, this was then opposed by a philosopher called Heraclitus who said, no, no, I agree, there's one substance, but it's not water, it's fire. This was then synthesized by Empedocles, who came along and said, well, if everything was made of water, it would just be water. If everything's made of fire, it would just be fire. So surely, it's a blend of those things. Earth, air, water, and fire, all coming together to give us all these different things. He proposed the four elements, air, earth, water, and fire, and synthesized the opposing ideas that had come from Thales, Heraclitus, and others. And this is not that dissimilar to our modern day periodic table, of course. So you can see how this works, but then watch what happens. Empedocles' idea then becomes the new thesis. This was then opposed by the Parmenideans, for reasons I won't go into right now, and synthesized by the atomists. And then, of course, the atomists becomes the new thesis. Do you see how this works? It keeps going through history, ongoing. Now, the reason why I've shown you all this Hegelian dialectic stuff is because it helps me to illustrate something that I think is really, really important about how philosophy works. That is that philosophy is collaborative. The idea, you can see how the ideas are working collaboratively here, particularly in the synthesis. But the progress is made through opposition. This means that when philosophers get together, they try to investigate a problem. They try to investigate whatever it might be. They're trying to find out well, what is true, what is right, or what makes sense. But in order to do so, they have to oppose each other. They have to challenge each other, question each other's assumptions. The word I like to use, which captures all of these checking principles, is re-evaluation. Philosophy demands that one re-evaluate. So what? Why does this matter? Well, one of my big claims today is that any systematic approach to doing something, whether it be history, education, politics, or whatever, it has to re-evaluate itself else it's in danger of moving into dogmatism. I know for a system to be a system, it has to have a kind of central core around which it hangs, but it has to question itself. It has to allow challenges, new thoughts, new ideas, in order for that system to be able to progress and develop. 
Think back into the past. There was a time when we understood the world through myths and legends. This was re-evaluated and replaced with a religious model. That in itself was re-evaluated and replaced with a scientific model. And science has gone through similar shifts, among many others, from Newtonian to Einsteinian, Einsteinian science to quantum science, and so on. Philosophy demands that we question the assumptions of whatever model it is that we happen to be under the spell of at any given time. Socrates described himself as a gadfly, stinging people into wakefulness, into thinking. Philosophy is that irritate, irritating insect. Philosophy is the annoying boy or girl at the back of the class asking those, those, those awkward questions. Me? You? You see, I'm not just addressing the rebels in the audience today. I'm addressing the rebel in each and every one of you and inviting you to cultivate him or her, to be a rebel but in the right kind of way. And to get this right, I believe that we need to turn to philosophy. Because, if I can borrow my Hegelian language that I've introduced to you earlier on, philosophy is the synthesis of collaboration and opposition par excellence. This is why Philosophy is necessary, in my view. This is why philosophy should be taught in schools. Because, after all, it's in school that you prepare to enter professional life and therefore to enter the systems. And because everything needs re-evaluating at some point, this is why I think philosophy is necessary for pretty much anything we humans ever do. Thank you very much.